I really want to, and I don't know. Can I do it after the World Health Assembly? No, you can do it But I can do it even next week when it's done. Yeah, And is there a Canada soccer? Oh, I'd love to do that. Yeah. You're on YouTube. Uh, again, I said before. Okay. Uh, again, I said before. Okay. Would you ever want to be health minister of Canada? I don't know. I'd be way better than the stuff I've had. I feel like I need to start having actual health people probably. It's weird. Rona Amber, if that's your background. <laughs> oh my god. Hi. Uh, it's actually a Bianca. Wait. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going okay. to start. So, there are still some. Later, we'll see. My name is Joško Mišer, I'm the scary scientist, recently graduated medical doctor uh, from Croatia, uh, and I'm honored uh, to be serving this year in IFMSA, International Croatian Medical Student Association, with Association as IFMSA president. Um, I'm honored to be able to moderate this panel today, uh, maybe even more excited to be able to discuss with you uh, meaningful youth engagement in health policy and programs. Not just with all of you global health leaders here in this room in Geneva, but also with our uh, friends back home who are watching us online as we have a live stream. So for those of you all who are social media savvy, and you look around the room, you'll see on the screens that we have a Twitter call. I guess it's called Twitter call now, or Twitter feed. So use the hashtag YWHA to engage in the discussions just for our panelists to be aware, um, if you'll be saying something that our friends back home won't like, you'll get an instant feedback on Twitter, but also if you say something amazing, they will get you an awesome feedback. Um, so use the hashtag YWHA, um, recommend everybody here in the room and also people watching online to, to engage in the discussion for what is to be very lively from our panelists and from the audience in the room. So we have gathered the panel from across the global health world to discuss why, in spite of a great increase involving youth in global health dialogues and consultations, young people have been expressing this dissatisfaction and frustration, highlighting the rather tokenistic fashion of these initiatives that involve young people. Consultations, conferences, meetings, and dialogues. So we also, Three years have passed since the resolution on youth and health risks was adopted at the 64th World Health Assembly 2011 that reads, the resolution says, urges member states to support the role of young people with special attention to youth organizations with the view to facilitating young people's empowerment and participation and influencing their environment in shaping public policy. It also requests Director General to promote the participation and empowerment of young people as key stakeholders in health development, including in the work of the organization. Since three years have passed, uh, this year, member states are going to be discussing the progress on this resolution, and there has been a report on this resolution launched a couple of days ago that says current mechanisms for the coordination of activities related to the health of young people are inadequate across the organization. Therefore, I have say decided to organize this side event to assess why there has been little improvement in facilitating and empowering meaningful youth engagement the work of WHO and in shaping public policy in general, to discuss the challenges of youth involvement in health policy making and program designing, designing while recognizing the potential benefits for adolescents and youth health of such involvement, 
and to also showcase some of the success successful initiatives the WHO sister agencies have implemented. So I'm briefly going to introduce our dynamic panelists. They're going to speak to you very briefly, and then we're going to open this up for discussion so that we really start evolving to the solutions and recommendations how to address meaningful youth engagement in a sustainable way. So we have Dr. Anders Norsa. There's no special introduction needed. So I'm just going to say that Dr. Anders is Ambassador for Global Health of Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Sweden. We have Michaela Togerberg, Youth Program Coordinator of UNA. We have uh, Alice Armstrong, who is currently working as a consultant in the WHO Department of Human Youth and Child and Adolescent Health. And we have two youth panelists, Barguru Vajau, who is a member of IFMSA, serving as a liaison officer to the World Health Organization, and Ryan Hollister, who is the executive director of UAM, University's Ally for Essential Medicines. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Anders. Thank you very much. Um, I was very happy to be invited here and also very happy when your previous president asked me whether I could do something in terms of IFMSA. I was once, of course, a medical student myself, active in IFMSA. I was the vice chair of the Swedish IFMSA at that time, some years back. Uh, I feel it's not that many years, but I suppose people say it's quite a few years. Uh, let, let me talk about three things. First is then, why is it important to have young people engage? And for me, there are, there are three things. There are three reasons for that. Uh, as you say yourself, I mean, the majority of people in the world are young people today. We have a demographic structure that is very clear. And if we then are going to get our health agenda right, of course we need to engage young people to have an understanding in terms of what our young people's needs. Uh, it's not good enough for some other people to try to sit and to define what those needs are, both what they are, how they should be delivered, how you should be able to respond to young people's needs in terms of service or a more health society. I mean, and, and that's quite a given that, that as there are so many young people, of course, those young people need to be engaged when we also formulate policy strategies, etc. The second reason is, of course, that, that again, I, I don't feel I'm that old, but I know that I am. At least my, my teenagers tell me that I'm old. Uh, and young people, you have different perspectives. You have different ways of thinking. You have been through different kinds of training. Uh, you have different ways of communicating. Uh, and of course, that is a value. That is an asset. So if we're going to get our work right in terms of being effective, in terms of good global health work, we need to benefit from that. Because I've got my experience, you've got your experience, you've got your skills, I've got my skills. So the more we get around the table of different kinds of skills, uh, at least my analysis is that we will be more successful. Uh, and my last reason is that you are the future. And by engaging you, hopefully you will have you will also get an interest in this and you will continue to work on health, especially on global and international health. If we don't allow you to be at the table and to participate, uh, I mean uh, then we won't get you, then we won't get the new generation. So for me this is also sounds quite selfish to ensure that there is somebody that will take over in the future. And by to be able to take over and to continue to work also for the future in slightly different ways, you need of course to have an opportunity to be engaged already now uh, in order to be able to be exposed to things like the World Health Assembly and all the very uh, very efficient international negotiations and efficient ways of working here, aren't they? Uh, second, in terms of meaningful participation, I, I think that there are, there are two sides to that. Uh, and I, I was, we were chatting a bit about that yesterday, uh, that of course, I mean, just to participate, I don't think that's a reason good enough for me. So if somebody comes to me and says, okay, I, I want to participate, I want to buy that. So, I mean, there must be a reason for doing that. You can't have everybody participating everywhere. So you, I think you, one needs to be quite clear in terms of why. What do you want to achieve? Why should you have a place at this table? So I think one needs to get that side of the agenda right to start with, so that it's not sort of and I think that has been some of the, the concerns that young people have been allowed to participate, but then you haven't really been able to play the kind of role that you would like to play. But then you think, I mean, I think you need to get it right from the beginning. What is really that you, we should achieve, you should achieve, by ensuring that we all have young people around the table. 
The second is then, of course, if there should be meaningful participation when we have agreed then that when, when there is that opportunity, like here at the World Health Assembly. I mean, one needs to have right opportunities to participate, but also right, uh, in some way, expectations in terms of how can you influence. Uh, and we were saying here that um, some of the work that is happening here uh, is quite frustrating, uh, it's quite lengthy, uh, some of it is totally meaningless, don't quote me. Um, it is. But it is, some of it is extremely important to actually have agreements in between governments. But, and I would say what is even more important, and again, don't tweet, tweet me, I've not been into one of the formal meetings during those five days. I'm not participating in the committee. I've been just interacting outside. I met with 10 ministers of health. All the countries where we have bilateral collaboration from the Swedish side, I've had that been participating in inside events, in panels, etc. That is how it is. So that sort of much more of informal advocacy work, etc., is why I for this assembly and what this marketplace of platform is really offering you. It's great to see so many people here, because I'm sure that you'll have also a lot of interaction outside the formal group. My, my final word is then to to think a little bit in terms of um, meaningful young youth participation um, also in what, not just how, but in what. And what I mean by that is that you can participate in different things. And what I'm thinking of are basically to be an activist, trying to influence policies, to push governments, to push organizations to do certain things. That's one thing, that's one drug. That's quite different from them taking a seat at the table, at the governance structure, at the board. And often, as when you are on the other side of the table, you're trying to get something new to done, then you're pushing the board. And this is an issue that we have when we talk about civil society. And in some way, we can say that sometimes you are seen as part of civil society. Uh, but you need to be a little bit clear here in terms of what side of the table you are. You can be on both sides, but you need to be clear, because you have different roles and responsibilities. Either you try to influence, or you will be part of decision-making and power, and then you will also be held accountable for that decision. You need to be clear on what age side of the table you are. Then, of course, young people are involved in actually implementing work. And that's a third row. And again, you need to be clear then. Are you pushing the implementing? Are you deciding on what implementers are going to do or what resources to allocate to youth organization in terms of implementing, you can't be on those three positions, at least not on the same time with the same time. And that is something I think one is important to think about when you speak about meaningful uh, youth participation here, that there are reasons why you should participate. Uh, it should be meaningful. One should be careful in terms of what thinking through carefully in terms of getting the agenda right to be serious about this. Uh, but then you need also to think through, we need to think through jointly in terms of what role are you going to play. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Anders. <laughs> Since Dr. Anders will have to leave earlier, because he's leaving Geneva, um, so we're going to start, we're going to open a uh, door for questions to Dr. Anders. So if there are any questions now. Maybe I can start with the first one. Um, so you said that WHA is kind of feelings have their sort of challenges and how we can influence the work of the organization. What do you think are those other ways that young people can influence the work of the organization, of the organization outside of other meetings such as WHA? I mean, to start with, a lot is happening before there. Uh, so by my writing papers, writing articles, uh, talking to government people that are going to come here. I mean, a lot is done actually before here. Uh, and both member states and the secretary, they're very sensitive in terms of what is actually being written. Both when it's of the media issues, but also when it's more substantive evidence of the base that here we have facts. So I mean, the, the work before here is possibly even more important than what is actually happening here. Uh, so, of course, there are many ways of influencing, and then also I think what's important is, is to learn how this organization is functioning. Uh, that the WHO is both developing policies, uh, some of them they are then 
quite extensive consultations. And at least my my feeling is that or view is that one are reaching out very, uh, at least with a lot of uh, efforts to reach the young people through those consultations. I mean, to use those opportunities. And most of the, those are web based. I mean, the more one engages and the more people that are engaging, the better. Uh, so, I mean, there are a number of opportunities where you can actually influence before. And then, of course, to be part of and influencing other organizations. Your medical students, MSF, of course, is very close. They're an extremely effective advocate today in terms of changing the agenda. So, by also engaging your own rights, also, but also working with other organizations, is of course another way of, of engaging. You're an age, you'll hear from Michaela. Uh, investing a lot of force in terms of reaching out to young people and really listening to them. There are many opportunities. Are there any more questions? Or reactions? Oh, yeah. You might dis totally disagree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to take this one and then. Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is concerning uh, uh, the youth as a whole, uh, as a concept. Uh, when we come to talk about youth, it's a very trendy topic, and people acknowledge youth during discussions. Uh, but when it comes to participation, uh, as you mentioned, and actual implementation, uh, youth is always missing. So why do you think, or what do you think is the reason for this link, or the first link issues between decision makers and policy makers, and having youth actually during the whole process and not just as a topic? To start, to, to start with, I don't fully agree that young people are, I rather call it young people than youth, that young people are not participating and, and that people are not listening. I think they are. Uh, and it's not, not just a word, it's not just a trend. I mean, at least we did a, the big thematic consultation on the future agenda for global health. I mean, a lot of young people participate. Uh, both at the final meeting with also throughout the process and, and definitely people are listening because it's not only because to be politically correct but you, you, I mean we have good messages, good suggestions uh, I, I don't come to the sense of uh, uh, I mean from the Swedish side I mean we, we, are, we, are, we are trying our best I mean we have had a youth representative we have had a person at our board delegation to the Global Fund now during the last four or five years we're now thinking a little bit how we're going to go forward with that, because we're working with UNAIDS. Uh, to all the UNGA high level meeting in New York, we all of us have young people with us. Um, so, I mean, the, I, I, I mean, I, I was, I don't remember whether it was the population or the Women's Commission in New York, when they were negotiating sexual reproductive health rights. They were always difficult, those issues in New York, very politically. Uh, the UNFPA, with our support, were very successful then bringing young people into the delegation. Okay, now we've got positive results. It was a major impact by actually having the young people in the negotiation, in the delegation, in the EU, and by them saying this is about us, we want this. Government will force them to have a much more positive outcome than we normally have. So, yes, of course, things can improve, but I see you also quite, uh, quite a few cases where it's actually happening. So, a lot of these. Um answers or questions that Oplanders made can be addressed to our next presenter, who is Mikhail Akadobra, Youth Program Coordinator in UNAIDS, particularly addressing the reasons for participating, what Oplanders highlighted, participating in what, and actually you be implementing the work. So, Bella? Uh, thank you very much, and thank you. I think that uh, I had a, a, some, some thoughts as well around why working with young people about Anders uh, covered most of it. Um, I work very closely with IPNSA with, uh, through a coalition of 25 youth organizations called the PACT for Social Transformation and the Age Response. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a collaboration that actually started after the frustration that Joshua mentioned a few years ago, where youth organizations came together and wrote a quite stern letter to our executive director and said, you know, the way that we've been working with youth organizations, we feel that it's actually quite tokenistic, and we actually feel that we're not being involved in the right ways, and we want to work with you in a very constructive way to develop a more effective strategy. And so we thought about how could we really do that? How could we have a broad-based consultation or find new ways of, of, of working with or, cons or consulting young people and what we should, how we should be working with? And so we launched this project called Prada 8. Uh, where we essentially have online as well as community consultations around the world. Um, 
where we ask young people to tell us what they think is going wrong with how governments are uh, engaging with young people, how the UN and not just UN but more broadly, so that we can learn from other people's experiences as well. Um, that all that data from some some, some five thousand young people around the world who participated was analyzed um, by a delegate by an online committee of youth organizations. They then drafted a strategy for UNAIDS that was presented to UNAIDS on how we should work with young people. And it's actually taken very seriously. Uh, by the organization and our executive <coughs> director set up a youth program within the organization as a result of this process. Uh, it's myself, Mimi, in a way, who uh, works with me, um, as well as one youth officer in each of our regional offices. And our sole mandate is around supporting youth organizations to get involved in decision-making processes, supporting youth organizations to be involved in the policy implementation, sort of in the program implementation cycle. Uh, and working with our co-sponsor partners, because UNAIDS as an organization is a, is a joint program, and we've got co-sponsoring organizations that have within what we call the division of labor, the technical leadership around youth programming. And some of the work that they do is technically excellent, but maybe that cycle around how you actually involve young people isn't always as good as it can be. And it's something that we're all at the of. So we're really trying to find good tools, good mechanisms, good models for how young people can be involved in the research phase, so when you're designing your program, of course, you need to do formative research, what Alex was talking about, how do you do focus group discussions with young people to make sure your messages are right, that you're implementing your program in the right place, that your, your opening hours are at the right time, and that your services are acceptable, etc. How you involve young people in the program design food, how you involve young people in the implementation of that program as peer educators or other outreach work, and particularly when it comes to the, the HIV epidemic, when we're working with some of the most marginalized populations, like young drug users, or young MSM, or young people who sell sex, and they're very unlikely to trust government workers or government healthcare programs. So there again, like working with youth organizations that have the trust of these communities is, is absolutely essential. Uh, and then in terms of evaluating and, and, and monitoring these programs and how, and what we define as a successful program, I think there's a lot to be done in terms of conversation around what actually works for young people and how you best document that. So there are lots of really positive things about working with young people that really is beneficial. And I think uh, crafting an argument around youth participation that is about the value that young people like Anders made, that young people actually bring to the table is incredibly important. So that's sort of where we come from. And of course we have a, we've set up a youth advisory forum. This was something that was recommended to us. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting structure. It's again something that we've discussed a lot. Uh, I'm not necessarily fully convinced that a youth advisory forum is the best mechanism for an organization like UNAIDS. Our mandate is around leadership, around advocacy, and just having a group of young people, uh, you could see that there's a sense of almost frustration within this group because they want to do more because of the type of work that we do. Uh, I think for WHO as an organization, that would be very different. I think that there would be a tremendous value for an organization like WHO to have a youth advisory board. Uh, particularly because it's a you know it develops guidance, it develops policy in a different way that UNAIDS doesn't do. Um, but I think that that as an entry point could also be very beneficial for reaching out through when they do consultations, having a structured mechanism for actually reaching out to a much broader and more diverse uh, group of young people. So there are there are different mechanisms for different purposes, and that's where I could see, for example, the PAC, which is uh, a very I think for the UN quite a unique collaboration. Um, it's an ongoing plan around five strategic areas that youth organizations have set for themselves of things that they want to see advanced in the AIDS response around age of um, consent or parental consent policies that countries have in place where young people can't independently access HIV testing or other SRI child services. Uh, around uh, transparency and funding and the global fund and where global fund money actually is going. Is it being invested in the right types of programs or the programs based on evidence? How can young people be involved in the mechanisms that the global funds have set up, such as both at the board, the global level, it's fantastic, but more importantly, uh, where those proposals are being made at the country level. So being involved in the CCM, so the country coordinating mechanism, understanding how those work, understanding how those who um, influences those processes. So again, putting the tools in the hands of those youth, or, uh, youth organizations that want to be effective within those spaces. So that's a tool that we've been developing with youth organizations. And again, um, more, um, sort of one of our biggest projects now is around young people's involvement in post-2015. Um, it's a project that's called Act 2015, uh, where we really want to put tools in the hands of young people to influence national positions. Because what Anders mentioned, 
Uh, of course, it's all good and well to come to the World Health Assembly or the final you know, global summit where heads of governments convene and uh, sign on to a declaration, but the advocacy work that needs to happen beforehand, it doesn't happen in New York, it doesn't happen in Geneva, it happens at country level. And setting up mechanisms or getting organized well enough so that you have people on the ground doing that work and actually having communications back to capitals when your delegations come to Geneva or New York to be able to put pressure because that pressure, you know, we know it all the time. You sit around the room, some, somebody's trying to push something and all of a sudden someone goes, can't really agree to that, need to get back to capital. Well, who, who's then influencing capital to make sure that they're actually asking for the right thing? So there's huge opportunities to really be smart about where and how you put pressure. So that's something that we're working, again, it's been a fantastic journey, uh, putting, um, you know, working really closely with these organizations, asking what they need, what types of tools do we need, how do we need to be working together? I mean, even for me, being part of a WhatsApp group of youth organizations, and, I mean, it's just a completely different world of how you can influence and mobilize. And so I think that that's, that's been an incredibly uh, exciting experience. Another great collaboration that hopefully Alice will be talking more about is around doing community consultations with um, young people affected by HIV and making sure that that feeds into global guidance. But I want to come down, that's your project, but we're working very closely on that. And that, again, it's another type of youth participation. And it, it might not be the most meaningful thing in the world to put a young drug user in the World Health Assembly. It might be good, they might share a testimony, and that might have an impact. But actually, it might be much better to have a community dialogue, a community consultation with members of their own communities, facilitating those conversations and get them to talk about what the most important issues are, and then have that information feed into global guidance so that that is, you know, that's another way of doing meaningful. And there, I think, again, I have to say we have more other youth organizations because of the networks that we have, because of the reach that we have. You know, you can really offer a service, quote unquote, to, you, to, to organizations like ours because we don't have those connections. So we don't have those next, I mean, we have now, thankfully, because we, we work really well. And that's something that's really you know, incredibly helpful. So, so those are some of the ways that we're working with, with youth organizations. And I think it's something that's just incredibly beneficial to the organization. And we have, you know, we've been created a, a huge amount of political space within the organization, but because we're delivering results for the organization. So it's not that it's like, we're doing it because it's nice, we're doing it because it's good. We're doing it because actually, this is getting us what we need. Collectively, as the AIDS response, what are we saying? We're doing push back on LGBT rights, we're doing push back on, on issues of marginalized populations, we're seeing you know, decrease in funding, and unless we have strong alliances with civil society, you know, we're not going to get the commitment to, from the global community. So for us, it seems like a very important and self evident way to work. So those are some of the ways that we're, that we're working with people. Great, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> So now we're going to hand over to Alice Armstrong, who will share a perspective as someone who has been involved with clinic national and international policy development on adolescents living with HIV, including the population, with a focus on involving young people. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. It's uh, wonderful to speak with you all. Um, so I'm Alice Armstrong, I'm a consultant working at WHO both in the HIV department and in the um, maternal, newborn, child and adolescent health department. Um, we've been working recently particularly on guidance around adolescent uh, testing and counselling, adolescent care. We're now working more towards um, uh, guidance around adolescent treatment. Um, and, and how do we we're thinking about how do we move past having one young person or one community representative at at the, the guideline development group. So currently how guidance is developed, I'm sure most of you know, just a quick refresher, it's based on evidence, we have systematic reviews, we have people questions, and a, a huge problem when it comes to guidance that pertains to young people is a massive lack of evidence, a lack of disaggregated data, and we don't know what, we don't have the evidence to present to the guideline committees, so we can't make strong recommendations around particular health issues that are really affecting um, young people. We've really come up against that recently, particularly with our key population guidance. Um, so part of the um, moving past the lack of evidence and moving past just having one young person on the guideline group, um, WHO also incorporates what's called values and preferences. And these are the community consultations that 
and I've had the privilege of being involved in, in developing the tools for some of those and also collaborating with uh, key community organisations um, that have reach of young people who we need to involve um, in the guideline process. So really the values and preferences is you know, taking their experiences, particularly pertaining to service delivery or these, for example, we just did a uh, big values and preference uh, survey and community consultations around the HIV testing and counseling guidance. And um, part of that was really to find out what do young people think about HIV testing, what are the barriers to getting a HIV test, what helps them to get a HIV test. And then the preference part really is thinking about how can services be better for you as a young person? How can you get access to a HIV test? So that's just one of the examples of a, a values and preference consultation. Um, and through that, we are able to take all of those views to the guideline development group. Um, so it's not just the view of that young person um, that is part of the group, it's the views of hundreds, and in some cases, um, with the HIV testing guidance from the survey that we did online, we have almost a thousand young people involved in putting forward their views through that way. So um, those really do have impact. I think the first the first time I was involved in it, I was a little bit cynical about how it was going to work. Um, how was how was the guideline group going to take all these views from young people? These are young people uh, in rural uh, Mumbai district in Zimbabwe. Um, who are involved in communicate, uh, community consultations, young people in the Philippines from key populations, how are those views going to be taken? And they do, they do have a, a strong voice in those, those settings. I think that we need some really successful strategies to make sure that we do this properly, that we have sound methodologies that Michaela was talking about, that we truly, you know, we're never going to get a whole world of representative sample of, of young people's views, but how do we broaden it? How do we do better um, at, at gaining those views of young people? And also, in a way, particularly for marginalised and vulnerable populations, that it's not done in a way that is harmful uh, to those young people who are involved. And I think that comes through the, the collaborations, um, and also through uh, using young people as facilitators and, and training them to be part of running the community consultations themselves. Um, there is one uh, recent one that was done in collaboration with UNAIDS and Youth Rise, and they had standard tools and protocols and methodologies, and it was around young people who inject drugs, and they brought young people from many countries to be trained and to know how to use the tools and the methodologies, and then for them to go back to their countries and to conduct those consultations, and also they were trained in how to kind of evaluate that data how to present that data so it can feed back to one overall report. Um, and I think those types of collaborations, and with, in terms of the sound methodology, it's very important to have uh, links with social science researchers and, and researchers who have been doing this for a long time. But the community link, as Michaela says, is the most important to have access to the right people, to ask the right questions. Um, so, Definitely, there are successful strategies that we can use to be better at it. Um, and there are, you know, there are a few manuals around about doing this, but unfortunately, not many people are using them in, ter in terms of doing the community consultations. And how do we have the accountability um, within policy development to make sure that we're doing those correctly in a way that is representative? So it's. I think that is some of the barriers and um, some of the strategies that we're facing in looking at how, how to do it better. Um, and the strengths are definitely the collaboration. Um, so another area I wanted to talk about um, is making sure that we are assessing what we do properly. So in the situations where we have done uh, community consultations, how do we assess how we did it um, so we can do it better next time? How do we assess the impact of the community consultation? Um, and I think that we, we, we still have a long way to go in doing that. And I think that also comes with putting that together and finding out how we do, how we have done in involving young people in, through community consultations and doing it better, you know, we create um, a strength in those community consultations and it's an incentive 
for policymakers to involve young people more. So we do need to be better at how we um, evaluate how we involve in young people. Um, I think also the last thing that I wanted to, to talk about is a, is a barrier that we face and we're trying to, to overcome, and that is around consent. Um, and I mentioned before we have a real lack of research when it comes to young people. And this has a lot to do is because young people can't uh, get consent to be involved from their parents, or researchers stay away from topics that have very complicated ethical uh, protocols that we have to go through. And then also ethical committees, they end up stopping a lot of research because it is quite difficult to deal with when it comes to involving uh, young people under 18, particularly in, in research. So that's one thing that we're really trying to push for and the UNAIDS and other partners and WHO is looking at guidance at the moment about how to involve young people in uh, research and that's including looking at the issues about consent in research. So you can keep an eye out for that. And I think that's, you know, for community consultations, this is a limitation. Um, with our uh, recent briefs that we're doing on young people populations, I mentioned the one community consultation, the, the barrier is that we we can't include young people under 18 um, in those those discussions, and we know from um, you know from from evidence and programmatic uh, people on the ground that these young people are are uh, facing particular issues, and having their involvement is really essential in uh, developing policy for them. Um, so yes, I think I probably talked too much about the barriers, but uh, <laughs> but I think that. Uh, Collaboration is key, and I think that for having young people more broadly involved in policy, I think is definitely key, and I really feel that community consultations are a way forward um, to move past the one or two young people on guideline groups and actually having whole communities represented at guideline development meetings. Okay. Thank you, Alice. So we've heard from our senior, sorry, <laughs> panelists, more experienced panelists, different ways how they involve youth in um, advocacy and developing guidelines. <laughs> now we're going to hear from our youth panelists a um, few words on how effective this is, what are the barriers of involving young people, and are there any new, fresh ideas how youth can be more involved in a, again, meaningful and sustainable way. So we're going to start with Barbara. Do they have lectures because of understanding? Do we have a different kind of lecture? So we often hear in our own way. Oh, but also lecturers and very um, Dr. Sigmund and Professor Rare and Tech Bell for doing that. Um, they have lots of other things that we're doing and we appreciate the presentation. Yes, I'm very um, so currently I'm serving as a liaison of IPC to WHO. And so I've had experience in the last month working in a youth organization and trying to um, trying to interact with uh, UN organizations. So I'm going to build up on that. And over the last nine months nine months I've also worked as part of the International Youth Task Force for the World Conference in Youth, which was an interesting perspective because I then was working with other youth organizations who interact with other UN bodies. So I'm hoping to give you perspectives from that of how other youth organizations interact with other UN bodies. How has my experience been interacting with WTO, with the youth organization, and what are the proposals we have? How can we learn from others, and what are the gaps that can be filled? So just back in the background, and remembering that WTO is part of the bigger UN system, and the UN system and the Secretary General in the second term has said that the youth is a big, one of his big priorities, and he's actually um, appointed a special envoy in youth. The UN also has an interagency network on youth development, and in that interagency network, all agencies are to feed into that network, but unfortunately, the WHO wasn't at that, point, at that last network. I mean, just to show, one, it's a priority for the UN, but two, there's also a gap um, of the technical health organization interacting with youth in the bigger UN youth, organ, youth work that's going on. And then to move on to that and to just underline that there is the international youth community. Not all of them are technical health experts or have an expertise in health, but they do exist, they do work in health, and there is room for them to feed into the technical work of the WHO. There's also the nature of youth organizations that 
fact that they work at a community level, and that's a problem that we have tapped into, giving into the technical world, and like Anna said, um, the, these values and preferences. But is there a way that this can be more systematic, more widespread, um, and build on this experience? And I hope that I'll give a, a suggestion for that. And I just remember the resolution that was passed in 2011. The, I've actually come to work, I've had to go to so many times. There's a bit of 64.28 that says there's a need to involve youth organizations in, or youth, young people in the work of WHO. And just to point out, the progress report for this resolution is going to be discussed tomorrow. And it does say that there is inadequate um, interaction by youth organizations. So there is a proposal to it, there is um, a call to involve people, there is a um, the WHO has recognized that there is still space and the mechanisms are still inadequate, and hope we can move that conversation forward. So how can we have this with young people, and how can they be involved more in, the, in this technical human health organization? So, to move on to why, what, why you can help, why should you be involved in health organizations, why should you talk about health issues? First is a youth part and a quarter of the world's population is youth. The youth are also going to people work, so that's important. But for more specific health issues, so just to give examples of human resources for health, human resources for health are built when people are, or when the future human resources for health are still in education. Human resources for health take a long time to build, so it's important to engage them at that level. So that's one of the examples of the technical area where youth are directly involved, where their expertise in this case will directly benefit the work of the organization. NCD, a lot of the work of NCD, a lot of the habits that lead to NCD start with the policies that are going to stop NCD from mitigating need to interact with the youth, with the young people. But for them to be most effective, the young people have to be involved at the point of making this policy to be with NCDs. And lastly, it's how how can you understand better the jargon of of the health community? Because what we discuss here is very difficult for anyone, any gamer out there. It's even more difficult for young people. So how can this be translated to, to easier things that the youth can, can engage with, they can understand more? And just to give an example, um, two weeks ago, Yosko and I were in Sri Lanka negotiating for the Colombo Declaration of Youth. And we had to break it down to all the youth participants, what is the universal health coverage? Why do you have to say accessible and affordable before universal health coverage? Because they were trying to convince us, no, you have said universal health coverage. You don't need to add all these other things into this declaration. But because we are in the technical side and we understood that, yeah, you from the technical side are able to explain to the wider youth community how it is important and what is the technical jargon and how does this relate to you. I can say have been working with WHO since 1956. It's been a great collaboration and I've been holding that for the last nine months. There are great examples of how you um, can input or how I can say that has actually influenced the work of WHO. And just to point that out, the working closely with human resources for health department in e-health, in curriculum development, um, and having people in ICMC going there on, um, every so often to actually input into the human resources for health and especially curriculum building. And that has been very key um, to the work of the human resources for health. Yesterday, the technical meeting, the director general mentioned the meeting with medical students, um, a few of us went to some of you in this room. And because of the meeting with the students at the past century, we were able to work together with WHO to make health stop being a need in the first draft, um, the zero draft of the real past century document, and work closely with WHO to, um, to elevate the profile of health in real past century and the outcome of it. And those are two concrete examples of you. But I can say I've had a great experience um, working with WHO. Is there a way we can open up this space to other youth organizations, keeping in mind how youth organizations work? So the, the fundamental reason why we need these organizations, if I can just tell them out is, or a structured mechanism in which youth organizations can be with WHO is the wider youth community will be able to be with that and then there's specialized young people who work on health issues. Um, there will also be space for multi sectoral invo involvement. How can we involve young economists? They may not be able to go through the rigorous process of making official relations with WHO, but there's a way that maybe young economic associations can input into the health economic work. Um, involving, making us part of policy making so that we don't only react to the policies that we need, but they're part of what is being built up in terms of health policy. Our creativity as we mentioned, as young people, can also be part of this policy. And we are the ones who are going to take over. And if, it, if we are part of this policy, it will be easier for us to implement this policy because they're going to be part of it. And also because there are examples from other UN bodies like in China highlighted, but also other UN bodies like China also have. Um, youth organizations that each are tailored to how they can work. So there is space for UN bodies to have advisory boards, youth forums, and other things. So what is our proposal? 
because we do have a proposal based on all this. Um, the proposal is to have both a youth advisory board that would input into the technical one. It could be represented to having a youth from democratically chosen um, people, um, youth organizations around the globe. Um, and this would input into the technical one. But there's also space for a youth forum. Uh, we have just come from the pre World Health Assembly, uh, which is how we build capacity for, uh, for youth before the World, before the world Health Assembly. And this can be expanded to include much more youth organizations and be an integral part of the community. So those are our two proposals. A youth advisory forum and a, a youth advisory board and a youth forum. And both of them working um, together to input into the work of the organization. The suggested mandate for these two would be to be representative of youth organizations um, across the international spectrum and practical youth level, to play an advisory role, to play an advisory role for both WHO and for member states because then we have a wider pool of youth that they could ask how can our national policies be affected, to build capacity for the youth involved, of course, accountability because these youth can only say, can only keep WHO accountable to what they are implementing, what they are doing, um, the guidelines they are giving out. Do these guidelines, um, do they meet the needs of young people? And this, this, this forum, this advisory board is also a space for young people, for young people, which is only there are benefits to them, so we put input into the direct work. There's a benefit for youth because we have a way of directly inputting into the virtual work. And a benefit, I think, most especially for the global community because normative structures um, that will be presented by WHO, the technical guidelines, they have the input of the youth. They'll be more creative, they're likely to last longer and be more effective. And so I think it's a benefit to all of us across. So now that we have the proposal, we have the money. How do we move forward? What can we get from the people of the This remains a suggestion. It remains an idea. We are hoping to push this forward to this idea. I think it's important because the virtual is governed and run by member states. To have member states taking this actively and supporting this and saying, how can this be moved on to something official? Because that would be interesting to see. But it's important that the member states um, they own this because this is the virtual um, is governed by member states. Support from the virtual is not that it's more important but more official recognition and um, more support from WHO as we move forward or if this moves forward. Um, and lastly, to say we are bringing this also on behalf of other youth organizations because we do interact with them in other UN fora um, and they, 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 also, they have us and we and other youth bodies. How can we or input more to help, and help on a global level? So also to say that we bring this forward on behalf of other youth organizations because there is space to more other youth organizations. Thank you, Google. We're going to move on to our next panelist, Brian Consford. As I mentioned, is the Executive Director of University of Zara for Essential Medicines. Brian is going to give us this perspective of a leader of the organization who is now going through this rigorous process of seeking an official commission of WHO. But I'm going to ask you to build up on this idea of a youth advisory board, a youth forum, whether this might make it less rigorous for other youth organizations to work with WHO, and would it be effective? Thank you. Sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, these are some great proposals, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, and also this uh, question of adapting to jargon and, and youth jargon. This is my fourth World Health Assembly, and I, I realized by the end of the week, you know, I just go out to dinner with a friend and they say something to me, and I have to fight the urge to say, thank you for your intervention, <laughs> rather than speaking like a normal human being. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely challenges like that that are faced. Um, but maybe just to give a little background uh, from our perspective and where we've come from as an organization. So. Uh, University of Allied for Central Medicines is a group of uh, students from many, many dis different disciplines. Uh, again, in the jargon here, you call it multi-sectoral. So we have medical students, we have uh, research students, law students, as well as public health, uh, social sciences, uh, from uh, at this point about 100 different campuses in probably 20 countries. And uh, we actually focus on, on sort of a niche itch issue, but one that's increasingly important, I think, in, in uh, global health discourse uh, around uh, access to medicines, around uh, what, how research priorities are set, 
how research priorities meet the most neglected health needs worldwide, and then how some really fun and complicated things like patents and technology transfer and intellectual property play into all of that, uh, which I know this gets you really excited and wakes you up when you hear those words. Uh, but the reason we focus on that uh, actually comes out of our position as students, as young people. Uh, you know, a decade ago when the first ARVs were being developed, about a quarter of them came out of universities. And so we had students on campuses like Yale realizing that medicines that were researched there and developed there, that sometimes they participated in the research and really, you know, did that because they wanted to save lives, were then being patented by the universities and licensed to drug companies that were selling them at very, very high, unaffordable prices in many countries around the world. And so we realized that we were sort of a unique constituency to call universities to account on that, call the global community to account, and really try to, uh, to uh, use our position as, as young people on those campuses to force down some of those prices and to get people to start thinking about access and not just making money when it comes to what goes on uh, in the research enterprise. And so we had some success there. Uh, and at some point, we started paying attention to this WHO process, which was looking at similar questions. What do you do in these areas where the traditional system of how we fund research and incentivize research through patents, through monopolies on intellectual property, where you invest a lot in research and then you charge prices that can recoup that investment? What do we do in the areas where that really doesn't work because it's just not lucrative enough? Uh, neglected diseases is one of those, obviously. There's a lot, some you've heard of, uh, you know, malaria, TB, some, some people haven't, like Chagas. Uh, but these are areas that don't draw a lot of research investment because uh, those traditional incentives don't work. And now we're talking about antimicrobial resistance, where there's a similar challenge. Because developing new antibiotics is just never going to be as lucrative as uh, cancer or heart disease research. So we started paying attention to this, this WHO process that was really looking at, can we come up with alternative models uh, that don't rely on uh, traditional intellectual property? It's called the, it has a beautiful, uh, harmonious name called the Consultative Expert Working Group on Research and Development, Financing and Coordination, I think is the full name, or CWG for short. Um, but you know, it's been, it's been building up for a couple of years now, and finally last year uh, at uh, WHO, there was a decision to move forward with some, some projects to test these alternative research models. And UN got involved, we really, we didn't know if uh, anyone would listen to us, but there was a consultation process that was sort of open to everyone, it wasn't youth focused, but we said we have some opinions on this, we want to talk about the specific role that universities can play in this process that don't necessarily have a traditional, uh, you know, profit driven incentive to do their research and could fill some of these gaps. And so we just sort of put our opinions together, some of our Norwegian students led the way here and, uh, and sent it in, and it wound up getting uh, quoted in the, uh, the report of the expert working group. Uh, word for word some of our submissions. It was on page like 200 something, but we were still very thrilled that it was in there. Um, so from there, you know, four years ago, I think the first time I came, we had maybe two students. Now we have a delegation of 14 from about 10 countries. Uh, as, um, you know, the, the minister here was saying that we uh, really do get opportunities not only to try to engage in the uh, official debates and discussions, but also just meet with representatives of our countries and, and uh, get to know what they're thinking about, get to share our own expertise. And I think this is a really important point uh, that Google raised here is that, uh, you know, it's not just about having less expertise and more expertise. There is really, particularly in this area, we often have conversations where we start talking about patenting and tech transfer policies at universities and get kind of a blank stare back even from very uh, experienced uh, ministers and experts here. So there's, there's opportunity for exchange and engagement. And I think that's one of the things we'd really like to see. It's important to involve youth, and I think, you know, but we, we have this question of tokenism. So it's not just involving youth for youth's sake, but involving youth for the specific things that we bring, the specific things that we can contribute, and making sure that those actually are contributed. So that's where I think these proposals are really significant. Uh, you know, in our effort to figure out, okay, how would we enter into official relations, so we're allowed to, like, have our own badges and go down and give inter interventions rather than coming in with another organization. Um, it's, it's not the most transparent process. I think, uh, you know, we've had to sort of figure out, there's a, you're supposed to enter into a project with the World Health Organization. And so one of my questions is, you know, what are, does what the WHO consider a project really align with what youth organizations might be able to bring and might be able to contribute and collaborate on? I think that's a significant thing to think about. Uh, making the process a little more straightforward. Uh, you know, being uh, under 35, we love online applications and processes. Uh, I think right now it's an official exchange of letters, which I, I don't know where the letter is. 
Um, <laughs> something on a piece of paper, apparently, that they used back in the day. Um, but so, you know, that's another place where you, where you can make things more conducive. Uh, and then finding ways to, to build this engagement. And, and so we've been working, you know, participating in the free WHA, which is really, really great. It's been a very positive experience for us to work with IFMSA on that. Uh, I think the, just to wrap up by highlighting some of the other challenges that we've encountered that might be addressed through some of these proposals. So that, there's first that question of how you get in the door in the first place. Um, and you know, I don't think most of the, we see more and more young people here every year, but in most cases, I don't think we were invited. We just sort of started showing up and figured out how to, how to work the system because we care, because we're interested. Um, and, and maybe that's okay, but I think you know, streamlining that process, making it a little more welcoming and finding concrete ways to do that would be effective. And then the next question is who shows up, right? Because we aren't just a large, undifferentiated group of youth worldwide. There's, there's a lot of different people that could be involved and a lot of different voices that should be involved in figuring out how you evaluate that, this question of who you would dem democratically select for some sort of uh, you know, advisory council or other youth mechanism. I think that's a really, really crucial one to think about. Uh, and then the, the final thing that, that we really learned, particularly from the work we do, um, is that what young people in many cases, uh, speaking for myself and members of UAM, really want to get involved in, why we pay attention to this, is that uh, we realize that there are things we care about, whether it's medical research or the law or other areas, where we really want to make a difference in the world. We want to have an impact. But we find that uh, the traditional structures that exist don't really enable us to do that. And there's been sort of a, there's an old school view, you know, in, in research and academia that you don't get involved in messy things like politics. You get a sense even in international fora like the UN or WHO that sometimes uh, advocacy and activism are dirty words. Um, but you've got a generation of young people that, you know, in my country, the reason we have the president we have now is because you turned out and got involved in politics more than ever before. We're excited about these things, and we understand that political engagement is required to have the impact we want to have on global health, on uh, legal structures, on international debates around how trade impacts health, which is another big issue now. So uh, allowing that engagement is really crucial, but that's often the area that makes people most uncomfortable. You know, if it's a youth consultation on a non-controversial issue, great. If it's a youth photo op, great. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, uh, youth having some real power to maybe influence, you know, who has control of, of global wealth, of global policy. I mean, this is what we see when we start talking about how universities manage their intellectual property. It's a very different conversation than talking about whether universities want to send us to Nicaragua for a week, right, to do a, some sort of project abroad. Because that, that has an impact on, you know, what they're thinking about in terms of finances, what they're thinking about in terms of their role in the global political structure. But I think to really, really allow and empower youth to have an impact, you have to give them some ability to have influence there. And you have to be willing to take the risk uh, that we aren't going to uh, you know, up in the world, that we might actually make it a better place. And I'll, I'll wrap with a quote I've heard a couple times this week uh, from Albert Einstein, who, who is apparently a pretty smart guy. But he said that we can't, uh, we can't solve problems by using the same thinking that uh, created them in the first place, right? And so I think. A really easy way to, to get away from the same thinking is to involve a newer generation that might think a little differently. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for our, thank you for our panelists. We're going to start a Q&A. We have a little bit of time, half an hour. Uh, maybe we're going to come up with some concrete solutions and recommendations. We already heard some of them youth advisory for youth advisory board. We heard that procedures of getting official recognition from WHO is not the, the best one. So are there any questions? There you go. One over there and here. We're gonna start three by three. Yeah, yeah so uh, sorry for this position but it's <laughs> so we've heard a lot about WHO and the UN trying to involve youth, and that's really well, and I'm enjoying that. However, uh, in order to reach more people, we know that international organizations are not really the main body of representation that youth should be involved in. So I would like to ask any one of you, if, do you think that the WHO, the UN, and other organizations 
uh, have done enough to push member states to involve youth in their decision making and policy making? And if not, what is or what do you think would be a concrete proposal or a concrete way for them to push harder for member states to actually involve more youth in when it comes to the decision and policy making? Thank you. There was a question over there. Thank you. Um, I'm Angela from the International <coughs> Students Federation. And um, first of all, thank you to all the panelists. It was a very interesting uh, summary of many, many points that were brought up. And it's not a question that more, more common that we are very um, positive about also the, the statement from IFM that we want more international student organizations to be involved in all these um, policy politics. And um, what I personally want to contribute is that I think it's very difficult for all these discussions here to be implemented on the national level. But that's what was also what I said that the country level is where we have to take action. But sometimes it can also be very inspirational to have country models as projects that can be a very good example of how you can actually change the world. And especially as young people, I think we can advocate also for actions. Like we have these little projects in our universities and our country level. They can be very simple, but um, they can be first an example for other countries to act. And also among students, we have a vivid exchange of these ideas and we can have collaboration uh, on very small things like the Jaguar Hospital or whatever that is showing, yes, we want to collaborate and we want you to be involved in all that. So, um, yeah. I believe that collaboration is the key and also that action can be a very good example. Yeah, and uh, if you have Oh, hello. So uh, I have a question for Ms. Armstrong and also a comment after Ms. Rogu's uh, presentation. So the question is, in your uh, community consultation, what is the proportion of youth who are actually HIV positive? Because my question is, how do you provide incentives for those non-HIV positive youth to participate in this? And this is indeed very difficult, and that is related to my comment. I, I'm a medical student from Hong Kong. Like, my, my, my classmates ask me, what, what the hell am I doing here? And because they, 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 they think that, okay, you must be interested in this. So if I'm interested in being a surgeon, for example, why don't I just study my clinical stuff, my, my book stuff? So, if, so some of them do not see the, the incentives, do not see the reason why they should be participating in, in, in the discussion of such issue. And in fact, if, sometimes if we want to be the new, new voices in global health, the first task is to convince our peers, our classmates, that why am I doing this? And, and, and that is why I think Ms. Barbara will give a very important point that we young people have to look into uh, the curriculum of the existing secondary education. Why do our classmates, sometimes our classmates do not care? Why do some youth do not care about some issues that we care? Are uh, something missing in our secondary education? For example, um, licensing of, of medication, for example, uh, empathy, for example, um, uh, the rationale behind screening. Why? Uh, it's, it's very important because the secondary education are, uh, is educating the future health workforce, that's for sure. And also, it is also educating the future public that we are going to work with. Because if we want our voices to be heard, we need a very large crowd. So my, my comment would be, if we youth want to change something from international level or national level, is that we should get involved in the development of secondary education nowadays. What should be done? What should be changed? in our secondary education. What should the education equip our high school students? Thank you. So we're going to round of answers for the questions. Do you want to start? Alice? Yeah, okay. Uh, firstly, uh, with the, the comment about how we get member states to involve more young people, I can just give you a, a quick example. With our HIV testing and counselling um, values and preferences that we did, um, after the guidance came out, um, countries that wanted to adopt it, an example is Ukraine, um, they went and they used our exact same methodology and tools and conducted the same community consultations um, within the Ukraine. 
So it's more uh, specific to, to that um, environment, to those young people's needs, and then they adapted the policy um, according to, to their own uh, community consultations and other evidence that they had. So I think it's about providing the tools, it's about leading by example, as you were saying, um, and Ukraine, obviously, they being able to do it, um, then other, other countries can follow suit and use the, the same um, to use the same methodologies and tools. I think sometimes it's it's quite um, a distant concept, you know, all this meaningful participation at country level and what how does that concretely look like, you know? What for me as a minister a minister of health or uh, someone who's doing youth programming, how do I get young people involved um, and have it have a say within the policies we're developing them? Um, I think it's providing those tools, leading by example and I think uh, another key is when you when you're involving young people, um, there is a there is a, obviously there's a sense of ownership, but there's also a sense of um, them putting on accountability to those countries. So, for example, in Zimbabwe is particularly involved uh, in the HIV testing, counselling, community consultations, and not just the young people involved in the community consultations, but the facilitators. There was a, an accountability that came from that, um, and there was a pressure that came from that um, for, the, for that guidance. And that similarly, there's been work, um, there was a community consultation, not particularly for, for guidance, but maybe to try and uh, put pressure within the Asia Pacific region to uh, create uh, specific guidance around uh, young people living with HIV. We did a fantastic community consultation with young people living with HIV. And um, you know that has been used as an advocacy tool um, by young people living with HIV and networks in that region to to push for change in services, to push for inclusion in um, policy. So just a few examples. I don't have all the answers, but uh, some things that people were doing. Um, for the testing and counselling, we actually didn't ask if the young people were HIV positive, um, because we were coming from the perspective of testing and um, in that particular situation, we didn't want to put that pressure on a young person um, within the community. Admittedly, some of the young people, especially when we talked about disclosure, they were able uh, to to discuss their status, but that's something that is for them to do rather than them feeling asked or pressured. And we wouldn't do that. This is why the methodology and the tools are so important, and, uh, and you know, situations arise within those community consultations. We also have people who are trained um, well enough to, to be able to deal with those situations. Um, so there are lots of ways that young people living with HIV are not only involved but are, are advocating um, for better services, etc. And I think Michaela can talk to some of those. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I was kind of reflecting on a um, question from on, you know, what? No, I mean, yeah, exactly. Not in, well, incentive for participation, I think, depends on what, right? Incentive in what? Yeah, that, that's one thing. I think incentives, it's tricky for a variety of reasons, and incentives for, particularly if you're talking about financial incentives or other types of incentives, there are always potential perverse outcomes of those types of schemes, and I'm, I'm not necessarily a, a huge fan. But I think just more broadly, it's kind of almost a, a, a philosophical question of, of what is it that makes some people care and some people don't. And I think that that's very, very particular to any given context. And you know, why do people get involved politically? And why do people feel solidarity? And why do people want to be part of solutions? And I think a lot of it probably has to do with, um, I mean, what, what Brian was talking about around traditional structures and how structures that don't listen or structures that don't you get feeling of disenfranchised, people aren't caring, why should I be involved? Or you know, I mean I think that there's a variety of reasons why. And I definitely I mean I would almost pose the question back to you. Like what what do you because you are the this is your community and your um, and your age mates or your peers. Like what what are what are the things? And keep asking you that question of why, why, why until you get to some kind of root cause and some kind of analysis that can really address why it is that people are not wanting to be involved and then address those root causes. Because I don't think that just 
you know, we're all part of these social structures and these social processes. And I think that just getting one person incentivizing that, but that's how you get organized so one by one. But ultimately, there are, I think there are major social processes uh, that, are, that are some of the reasons why people aren't getting involved. And I think that they definitely need to be addressed. And I think that you know, that even is a, a sort of a, one of the other, you know, hugely important reasons for why young people need to be involved. Because we know that, you know, health, yes, is produced in the healthcare se sector or the health sector, but a lot of it is produced outside of and a lot of it is around the social determinants of health and the political determinants of health, the poor you know, public policy and laws that, that are barriers rather than them promoting healthy lifestyles, etc. And so I think that you know, being involved in changing those social processes and those social structures around gender dynamics, around inequality and income inequality in your countries, those, those are fundamental political questions. And uh, you know, how do you incentivize people to care about politics and care about I, I definitely I think it's a fantastic question. I don't have the answers here. I think it's something that we need to continue talking about. It was also linked to education, a question yeah. what kind of actually students, medical students, doesn't matter medical, mm -hmm. students in general, are we creating to our secondary education? Maybe Brian Valdu would like to comment on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's a question that we need to do for some But maybe it's how um, international organizations like WHO can fit into um, national um, I think it's formally recommended when the national, when nations choose to bring these delegates to international institutions. So at the UN level, at the UN level, UN youth delegates are recognized. So if, and definitely there are such as where we have youth delegates, so they can recognize those and then incentivize other nations to bring young people to international Yeah, I mean, I can try to speak to the secondary education question uh, quickly because it, it is an important one and one we think about a lot, particularly the areas we work on, as you mentioned, uh, you know, if you're getting medical training or even doing research training, you don't learn a lot about how that research actually gets developed into uh, something that's sold on the market. If you're often just asked to sign something when you start working in the lab, saying I'll turn over all my intellectual property to the university and, and go on about your business. Um, and the other area is, is, is uh, neglected diseases. And, and we try to interpret that broadly, really neglected health needs. But there are whole areas that uh, there's just very, very little education going on, and, and it's um, there are a lot of uh, incentives that just don't work there. I mean, we looked and we found uh, we did an evaluation this past year, only about two or three percent of research spending at, at the top 50 U.S. research universities is going to neglected diseases, uh, including neglected aspects of HIV/AIDS, and uh, there's not a lot of training or incentives for. Uh, students to focus in that area. There's not a lot of faculty support or uh, university support in those areas. So I think that's really crucial to, to develop, uh, giving people this sort of understanding of the political structures that operate and impact what you're doing, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a researcher, whether you're a lawyer, uh, but also, uh, again, you know, achieving some integration there. And I think one of the challenges we've actually encountered is we build chapters on campuses, particularly in um, sometimes middle-income countries, is that you have a law school that is not only separate from your medical school, but you know, like some places in Brazil, it's in an entirely different part of the city or in another city entirely, right? So then it's much harder to have uh, any sort of cross integration there or any sort of interdisciplinary collaboration. And so you get situations where you have researchers who are just focusing on the research and then you have business students who are being taught that the way you commercialize everything is by patenting it and charging as much as you can for it and nobody's talking about the specific ethical issues at the intersection of those two things when you're trying to commercialize <coughs> something like a medicine or a diagnostic. Great. Thank you, Brian. Questions? There, there, and there. Okay, Lund from the Intercom International Capacity Plus. I think she's a global workforce program, and I speak from the perspective of someone who wants to engage much more in, in a global context. And I think that, you know, sitting on boards and giving advice is, is, is very nice, but we're a movement their real impact is in accountability governance at the local level. In crowdsourcing, presence or absence of medications at facilities, presence or absence of the local order, you know, unfair treatment at the facility level. Because that's where accountability really falls apart and where we can't hire enough people to, to do that, or where leaders you know, aren't interested in that type of accountability. But you can communities are one set of suffering because of the services on board. So that's what I see. Most countries here are in the upper two 
name's Jeremy Sayed, I'm from the WHO Department of Service Delivery and Safety, and it's just really great to be here. Um, one of the things that has come up in the discussion is the importance of generating new ideas and getting innovations to flow around the world. And just one thing to ask the, the distinguished panel about how you see the, the power of youth in um, recognizing uh, that innovations can flow from low income countries to high income. And the world of uh, when you guys are looking after the youth and making sure the youth data is going to happen in 40 years' time, maybe it will be a flat world. But the question is um, what is the role of the youth in creating that movement that my colleague just mentioned? Creating a movement to understand that the, the high income to low income paradigm is, is, has ended and that the low income and high income paradigm. Is something that we need to do. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, my name is Alexander Papadopoulos. I'm a psychiatry resident. I'm here from uh, well, representing the Junior Doctors Network of the World Medical Association. So, I graduated in May 2013, which means that until May 2015, I was the IP say. So now I'm working, and I can see also the other side of the river, so I would like just briefly to share some thoughts. Um, it's not very organized in my head, but I mean, the discussion is so broad, I'm going to be off topic anyway, so I'm just going to say the things that I think, and well, um, probably I'm going to be hated a bit too, but well. So my first point is that young youth organizations and young people have one set of qualities that are at the same time um, their, um, let's say, what makes them powerful and what makes them weak, according to my opinion. Uh, it's this huge motivation, the sleep deprivation, the working for many days, the, the, the crazy ideas, the, the many, many meetings that we have and everything that we do, um, but for a short period of time. When we talk, for example, about, I can say, because the turnover, is quite big, and we have to acknowledge that. There are, because everything depends on people, no structures. I, well, this is what I believe. Uh, it's not necessarily the truth. So, um, this was my first point. Um, and I would like to tell, to say that, um, there are great, there's a great number of, of, of workforce in Italy, uh, when we talk about young people. Um, there are, like, I can say, for example, represents 1.3 million medical students worldwide. That is a lot of people. And young people, young medical students, for example, who I can talk about, um, go out there on street actions. Uh, they educate medical students. They, they work after university for crazy hours. They don't sleep a lot to do all that stuff. Most of the time, it's because of very uh, genuine um, goals. Um, so I would agree on that aspect that use young people, especially for the local level and the street actions and the dissemination of information, everything that we discuss here. Because honestly, well, I've never heard on TV talking about the WHG, for example. So I don't know how many people know that there is something like this. So medical students or young people in general could be part of that. So this was my first point. My second Alex, I, I know, I'm taking two minutes, I'm just taking two minutes. So, <laughs> okay, two minutes. I'm sorry. Can I, can I ask a question? It's not a question, it's a, uh, it's a it's my reflection on, on this discussion. <laughs> 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 can we are at the traffic light? I'm going to say two, two things. And can one you minute. ask a question? No, I will not ask no? a question. Okay. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but I want to ask a Dr. Thompson? Um, can I use your microphone? Yes. <laughs> it's a question for the, which is the largest geopolitical youth forum in the world that is the most well funded tool? And if you can answer me that, then we're a guru, I will say yes. If I was the director general of the <coughs> Great I would say yes, please have a youth forum. Then I could forget about you. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to let our group think of, and the rest of the panel think about it more. But uh, we're going to start with the first question. 
but with a presentation on Peru. Does anybody want to comment? I think that's the aim of what Barbu was saying, that youth form would make it more representative of it. Youth development would be more representative. It would not, not, not just be I can say or you are yeah, or medical students who actually turn up in these meetings or are consulted, but we will be able to identify more youth organizations that bring them together on the same table and actually make it a bit more dynamic, multidisciplinary, and transparent as well. Michaela? I mean, I guess two things. One thing I think, I think definitely there is a part, part of that is a responsibility on us to make sure that we don't, as the UN, work with one organization and that we make a concerted effort. Uh, because that, this is a lot of that happens. Like, this, uh, these are our youth networks. And it even happens with big civil society organizations. We have our youth organizations. We have our youth networks. And I think that, you know, one thing that's been so inspiring for the way that we've been working is really about bringing together a whole range of different youth organizations and saying, how can we contribute? How can we work collectively together? So I think that that is definitely one part of us, of being, not being selective, not being sort of cherry picking, but really trying to bring different types of organizations together. The second point, and it was even a tweet to say, you know, youth or youth, uh, getting organized at the country level is most important. And I, I think it's something that's actually, I don't think it's necessarily true. I think, you know, you're saying that, um, yes, accountability at the country level, yes, community level, yes, that, that's critical, but I think that there's a huge amount of value of forcing the people who are part of traditional structures to interact in a forum like this with young people who have different perspectives and different lines of arguments and might not buy into the same types of arguments and rationales for why things have to be so. And I think that we saw it very clearly when we were in Sri Lanka uh, negotiating this outcome document, having member states having to lobby youth organizations for their positions, like the change in power dynamic that that creates is fantastic. And I think that they're faced with people that aren't necessarily arguing, uh, you know, making arguments for you know, rational political or you know, politically arguments that are you know, within a, a given context, but arguments that are really idealistic and aspirational in a way that you know, maybe people who have been in the game for too long don't necessarily always have anymore. You know, at one point they had them. Uh, and I'm not saying that all older people are not that aspirational or idealistic, but I do think that there is something very special about that period of time in your life when you don't have responsibilities and you don't have families and children and you don't have, you know, you think more gadgets and you don't have all of these things that make you, you know, less dependent and less um, committed to, to something. And you can, be, you can be more ambitious and you can, you can really try and craft uh, a new idea about what things can be like because you're not so big in the system. So I see tremendous value in having young people, and that's what Dr. Anders also said, and having young people in the ICT negotiation as part of national negotiating delegations was fundamental to shifting the member states' weak text around sexual reproductive health uh, that they wouldn't have been able to get if they weren't young people in the room holding their own governments accountable to saying, we know what you're, we're part of your delegation and we're listening to what you're committing to in this room. And I think that that's a, that's a fantastic uh, addition to the international um, governance system and, and global governance system. So I, I, I think that both are really important. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, the about if we more representative to convert the students and the same are more likely to be in the higher income class of the of the society. And that's why a forum would be good because it opens up that space. Or the same for youth organization. So even if it's a local local you get to report to the health issues in a village or in a community somewhere, then if there's a structure that has been fully taken in that that immediately breaks up. I mean, I just uh, add to that the um, there, there's a consideration with that, which I think you suggested of the unorganized youth as well that, that we don't always operate in youth organizations, um, but still have a lot to contribute in terms of you know I mean Twitter is a great uh, example of this of, you know it's not all about uh, very nicely crafted tweets on you know whether a policy should be adopted or not, but you can turn it on some night and find 500,000 people under 25 complaining about you know, any number of things that affect their lives, whether it's access to public transportation or medicine or a whole range of other issues. So the, those opportunities to figure out how to really engage youth that aren't necessarily strictly in an organization but still have a lot to say and often come to that from their own self-interest rather than thinking about it in sort of the the approach that, that, that we think about it on and how to bring those two together so that you can actually uh, channel that impact and that motivation into something that does great change at a, at a larger level, I think is crucial. 
and the person that comes from? The Christina person. So, yeah. this is the largest <laughs> youth forum in the world. It's your political youth forum that consumes the most amount of government time and money, and which I am sure you will never see has exercised the slightest bit of influence. The G20, G8 meetings are always accompanied by a new forum. It has absolutely no influence on all of the things that we're worried about. And yet it, 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 it's done precisely for the purpose of allowing the G8 and G20 heads of state to say, oh, we've done something for you. Just to respond to that and add to that, and that it's good to point out that I think that's why we're concerned to say it's meaningful. We don't want to have young people here to come outside the family and say, oh, there were young people around in the community. It's a reason why the suggestion that how can we feed into the technical work? Just to add that here, uh, as I said, we are trying to work on the feedability. We do work on it for six months and try to give it something meaningful and see how can we want the capacity to build this youth and to how can we ensure that this is actually something meaningful, the youth need something, to be actually go and influence what's happening in the WHA. So it's not that say youth participation hasn't been influenced in the past, because it has, but we also feel like a youth community needs to take that upon ourselves and say, if you're given space, how will it be meaningful and how will it actually impact uh, positively what's happening in these developed international forum? Last question. Mm -hmm. Could you use the microphone? Oh, yeah. Um, I just had a question and kind of a response also to Brad Pound's work. Um, I don't understand how you say you're getting information from the news through Twitter. However, the um, underserved populations don't have access to internet. Um, how are you getting information from the population and people of society? So I guess for this is a question for Barb, but the panel also kind of answer. So, yeah, I'm not sure I can I can master that one entirely by myself in this context. I mean, you know, there there is actually I think a conversation in some some data that shows that there are different ways that uh, youth engage, and you know, Twitter is is the example I use, perhaps not the best example, but you certainly actually do see, you know, I mean, I mean, you hear about this all the time, the level of smartphone penetration uh, and dumb phone penetration and just basic mobile penetration, and that's uh, so texting, tweeting. These are things that at least young people are likely to be doing in higher numbers and likely to be relatively expressive on and an opportunity to, to meet people at. And there's a lot of discussion about you know, what other forums and contexts where you have people going that uh, are younger, that may have nothing to do with their income level, that may have nothing to do with their political engagement, where you can reach them on, on crucial issues like health. So um, you know, there's, there's another interesting conversations around like, you know, could you engage people at, at cultural events, at music festivals, at things that tend to draw people in any way. Um, you know, and they're at, at workplaces for that matter, workplaces that tend to have large numbers of, uh, you know, lower income, younger people. That certainly, uh, there are some specific places where that happens and where people are now working to do engagement and organizing in those forums. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, the, the challenge is that the, the poorest people are going to be the difficult to reach and particularly poor young people. And you see this reflected in uh, health statistics in every country in the world, including mine, where the, the biggest group of uninsured is young and poor. Uh, and the big challenge with uh, Obamacare was getting getting people to sign up, right, uh, from that demographic. And uh, it's not something that I, I think anyone has quite cracked the uh, cracked the code on yet. Um, but it's it's uh, absolutely a crucial priority to figure out how to do that uh, and to continue to have a discussion. And I think, you know, hopefully at least other you have some insights that might be helpful there, and that we can contribute even to to that specific. Question. I think, I, think uh, I, I agree with, uh, with Brian as well. I think that um, 
first of all, mobile penetration is actually reaching a lot of people, and I think that penetration I think currently in Sub-Saharan Africa stands at 13%, uh, which of course is not, it's, it's very far from the levels of penetration in, uh, in other regions of the world, but it's still 13%, and I think that they're just sort of laying out a, a massive uh, you know, fiber optic cable that will start connecting people at a much higher, a higher speed. But the second, the second point is really around using online media for organizing people offline is really effective. And we've done it uh, in, in two, two different projects. Where you can, we can use online to, uh, media, you can use Twitter, you can use to get at people who want to go out and do projects in real life, out there, with people who don't have access. So we've done that for Crowd at Age, we did it for Act 2015, where we have you know, a discussion guide, we get volunteers to sign up, we send them the discussion guide, they go out to a rural community in northern Nigeria, to a school, they hold a consultation, and they report back and say, these are the things, and these are the priorities that these young people want to see in the post 2015 agenda. And I think that there are ways of using online technology for organizing offline and reaching those people too. So I think it's, uh, even though they might not have connection, it, but there might be a way of, of, of leveraging the technology nonetheless. Great, thank you, Kella. So we've run out of time, it's 7.15. Uh, there were many more questions from the audience. Um, so I would like to recommend and suggest you that you engage in the discussion on Twitter, because I realized also that there were questions from um, our Twitter audience, thanks to our live stream. Um, exactly following what has been said, the power of Twitter, the power of social media, uh, I'm sure that we can have a quick discussion in there. So just to highlight some of the things that we mentioned, uh, we heard clear benefits of involving youth both in the work of advocacy, in research, in developing guidelines, policies, and recommendations. We heard that uh, the current, and this is also what WHO recognizes, the current structure and mechanism of, of involving youth in the work of the WHO is not satisfactory. Um, there are different ways how we can overcome that. Or who pointed out to youth advisory board, youth advisory forum. Maybe this could be an answer how to make youth involvement, youth participation more representative, how to reach the underserved. So that this time next year, we can have more diverse participation, more diverse audience. Um, and until youth advisory board or youth forum happens in WHO, we will continue organizing our pre World Health youth forums, youth assemblies, how we call it. If you organize this year for a second time, we will organize it again next year. And all of you who are interested um, in being part of it, please do talk to us. We can provide you with more information involved in the, in the program next year so that we can be better prepared, not only for the World Health Assembly, but for different other global health for our World Health needs to be represented. So thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. Um, that's it. Get us in the picture, we'll stop it.